Well, well good morning, uh, Gen X uh, customers and friends. Um, we're excited to give you a little update uh, regarding the December SIRE summary today. Um, you know, today's broadcast will cover a little bit about some of the changes that happened this SIRE summary, um, some of the exciting highlights that we have within our Gen X lineup. So uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is John Sheppers. I am the peak female lead, so uh, oversee the uh, selection of donors and matings and uh, responsible for a lot of the, um, the mating decisions that result in a lot of the exciting bulls that we have in the Gen X lineup and, and bulls to come. And my name is Jenny DeMonk and I'm the Dairy Product Support Manager. Um, anything related to genetic data uh, comes through my department. Uh, genomic information as such. So we do a lot of the administration with the bulls um, to get them to uh, be able to launch and re release those into the Gen X lineup. So um, this morning, I'm going to touch on uh, the new feed save trait uh, and a couple other of the new exciting um, additions that we have. Um, and then I'm going to turn things back over to John uh, and he'll have a few other extra highlights for everyone. Um, for the first picture, um, I'm going to just kind of touch a little bit on Feed Saved. We know it's the largest um, expense for dairy herds. Um, there's definitely benefits to improving feed efficiencies, obviously lower feed costs for herds, less manure and greenhouse gas, uh, impact on the environment is key. Uh, and just for producers to be able to better use their, their land crop for growth and manure spreading. There has been throughout the last 50, 60 years, a ton of progress in milk production. And while that has certainly helped improve feed efficiency, um, we're really at the point where the next step is to, um, to improve the feed uh, utilization. Um, and so um, I just wanna touch a little bit on kind of the process of feed energy utilization um, in the cows. So my diagram here, I just show, of course, a little picture of corn. Uh, which is the gross feed energy that is going into the cow. And we know that there's loss, there's manure loss, there's urine, heat from the cow, from her digestion and metabolizing. Um, and then also there's energy loss uh, because she needs to retain that for her own energy. So when it comes down to the net feed energy that is left, uh, we're really wanting to maximize that feed energy that can be captured to produce milk. And so ultimately we wanna select those kinds of cows that have high yield, milk yield and uh, low maintenance cost. Um, and so that these cows have a high proportion of energy per unit of feed that they consume. So um, how this new trait released by CDCB here in December came about, um, there was a first study that was funded by US taxpayers that study spanned from about 2010 to 2015. Um, and then the, they were able to capture uh, residual feed intake phenotypes. And you'll hear um, RFI uh, as a new acronym out there. Again, that was residual feed intake. And uh, they captured 4,753 phenotypes through that research. Um, so they were measuring things daily, whether it was milk yield, the dry matter intake, the body weight, um, the, the body um, score of the cow, any health events, and um, measuring, you know, how much feed was um, the dry matter intake and such there. Um, there were a lot of different cooperators within that study, a bunch of different universities and so on. So um, that's what really got us the base to see that we can measure this and we can see um, the opportunity for genetic progress. Uh, there are differences bull by bull. Now there's also research going on today um, through the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. And um, that's to gather um, additional phenotypes. Uh, again, the important thing with genomics is to continue to have a phenotypic database um, that stays up to date, that improves uh, accuracy and reliability of the trait. And so that research continues to go on. Uh, that research began in, two, in 2019 in the spring. And now today, 
Um, if you include from the first study plus the second study, we're up to 6,231 um, RFI, residual feed intake phenotypes. Um, the goal as far as to continue to grow that population as a base population, um, year by year, the, they're planning to add about 750 new um, cows to that population. So currently feed saved is around 37% um, reliability. Uh, there's already different ideas that are coming into play to be able to collect the information even quicker. Uh, we all know that why it took so long to get feed efficiency as a new trait was because it was something very expensive to study. So some of the ideas that are in development are some different 3D cameras um, where a cow would have, or they'd have the ability basically to measure the pile of feed that's in front of her when she begins to eat. And it even can detect the cow based on her color patterns, which is incredible. As we look at feed intake, uh, residual feed intake, and I'll talk about body weight composite. Those are really the two components of the feed saved um, evaluation. Um, just some history because obviously body weight composite and uh, components of body weight composite we know have been part of ICC as ICC was first introduced in 2014 and then um, has become a more major uh, weighting in the lifetime net merit index as well as other indexes in the industry. Um, since 2000 for net merit, um, there have been deductions for um, the high feed cost for larger cows by putting a penalty on body weight composite. Uh, in 2017, uh, the, well, body size composite was what it was first called back in, in 2000 as it was introduced into net merit but it was replaced then by what we know it today of body weight composite. Um, but at that time, when it moved from being called body size composite to body weight composite, um, the formula was updated and it now uh, better predicts body weight. Um, it was at that time when dairy form was added um, to the body weight composite index to uh, again, help better predict that weight. Um, so there's more research out there that shows that one body weight composite unit is now equivalent to 40 pounds of um, mature uh, body weight rather than previously when it was measured at 35. Um, I do know folks from, from Gen X have heard a lot about 35 pounds um, as before we introduced body weight into ICC formula, um, that 35 pounds in body weight composite difference was uh, brought up in many different scenarios. Now, when you take a look at a lot of the other income and added costs for body weight composite, a lot of those are, are already part of net merit. Um, and so if you really look at all the income and expenses that they're really all converted to feed uh, pounds per lactation. Um, so it's really maintenance plus other items. So it's about 138 pounds of dry matter intake per unit of body weight composite. Now a little bit more on the definition of residual feed intake. The residual feed intake is really the difference between the actual feed intake versus the expected feed intake. And how the expected feed intake is calculated, um, we really look at the, the production uh, ability of the cow and the body size. Uh, to come up with what do we expect this cow is going to uh, do for her residual feed intake. And then her actual feed intake is what was measured um, on those research farms. So it's really the difference between what we expect it to be and what it actually ends up being. And so the feed safe formula is that combination of body weight composite and residual feed intake. Um, and if you look at the uh, reliability, I mean, body weight composite is a, is a very high reliable um, trait, uh, nearly 80% reliability. And the overall feed saved is around 37%. So I just want to touch a little bit on my second picture. Um, and that's really to talk a little bit about the range of what we see in the population for the feed saved PTA values. 
Um, if we look at the December sire summary active bulls, the range is between plus 419 to minus 598. Um, and that plus 419 to minus 598, again, that's active bulls across the industry. Um, this chart also shows you 95% of the bulls in the population fall between a minus 218 to plus 218. Um, keep in mind with feed saved, the positive numbers are the ones that indicate that cows eat less feed than what we expect them to do. Um, so that's really when you're looking for a bull to pass on those good genetics for feed saved, we're looking for a bull with a positive number. So my third image here, I really wanted to give everyone a good idea of how um, you can value one bull versus the next. Um, and I think this is a, a good example. Um, the bull curfew that's in the, the Gen X lineup, he's at plus 342 for feed saved. Uh, there's a bull by uh, Select named Geronimo and he's valued at minus eight. Now, both of these bulls have pretty similar body weight composite and milk production uh, PTA values. And so they're good ones to compare against each other to be able to say that curfew daughters are gonna eat about 350 pounds less uh, per lactation than a Geronimo daughter. Um, and so when you consider all of that, that gets to be pretty significant dollars. Um, one of the, tidbits that I had received was the feed efficiency that, that could be gained just by the variation in the bulls that are out there from an industry standpoint is around $8 million. So, I mean, this is definitely a trait to um, be excited about. Um, it's here. And as we move forward, uh, April of 2021, uh, potentially August of 2021, but sometime here pretty uh, early or mid of 2021, we expect to see this feed saved be incorporated into lifetime net merit. Uh, and I would say, uh, while the numbers are not out there as far as the exact weightings, uh, we, we should see that that feed saved has a more uh, or has a higher weighting than currently, like what the body weight composite does in net merit index. So they'll definitely be more of a focus. Um, also, from an ICC standpoint, we're going to be evaluating that index and, and how feed safe can be part of that index, again, around that same time frame for hopefully um, being able to tweak ICC here coming in April. While feed saved really has caught a lot of buzz um, for this sire summary, keep in mind that there was also a new trait of heifer livability that CDCB released. Um, and obviously improving heifer, heifer livability, um, overall heifer health and welfare is a very um, costly thing for our producers. And um, a lot of these heifers are, are having to be um, called for digestive and respiratory issues, um, or it just gets to be to the point where they, they die. Um, with this new heifer livability trait, it is important that when you think about the definition here, we're not looking at the death rate. Um, we're actually looking at when she leaves the herd, it's, it's did she die or was she called? And um, obviously we want to be able to cull rather than have them die because there is a value that that farmer gets from the cull, cull check um, rather than her just dying on the farm. Um, the average cost of heifer loss in general is $500. So in general, it is pretty significant. And if you look across the Holstein and Jersey breeds, um, the average heifer livability is 96% in the U.S. Um, so I do just want to give a little bit of background on the data source. Um, I said before the data comes from CDCB. There is some um, 3.4 million records for heifer disposal codes in the database. So it is some, some pretty uh, hefty information when it comes to how large the data set was. And the information that we're looking at is from calves that are between two days old to 18 months old. So it is not the same as just looking at stillbirths because the stillbirths are not being counted. Those stillbirths are from 48 hours 
um, if the death happens within the first 48 hours, that's considered a stillbirth and is not at all part of heifer livability. Um, the other key thing with heifer livability um, is that when you look at a bull by bull scenario, a bull that would be, let's say, plus two for heifer livability, we would expect the heifer survivability to be 98%. Um, so ideally, the more positive the number for heifer livability, the better. So if you had a bull that was at minus two for the heifer livability PTA, 94% would be our expected heifer, uh, heifer survivability percent. Um, a little bit more variation in the Holstein breed on this one and really probably has to do with the size of the population. So a standard deviation on the Holstein side is 0.5 and on the Jersey side is 0.2. So 95% um, of your Holstein bulls are gonna be between that minus one to plus one heifer livability. Um, so if you're kind of trying to wonder um, what how you use this trait, um, that would kind of be your your 95% uh, range. Heifer livability uh, does correlate pretty strongly with productive life, um, also the calving dollars, and it also has some significant um, correlation to uh, the yield traits, so your milk fat protein, um, and then. You know, the real recent year trend is positive for heifer livability um, because really we've had selection pressure on a lot of these positive correlated traits. And that's probably why this the introduction of the heifer livability maybe doesn't quite catch the buzz of what the feed save trait is that I just uh, talked about a little bit earlier. We'll obviously take a look at how heifer livability might be able to play into ICC for both um, Holstein and Jersey's for the April 2021 ICC um, potential changes. Um, just one other um, trait, or I should say new thing that I just want to introduce is uh, the Jersey Association has announced that there is a new undesirable genetic factor that has been identified. Um, its acronym is JNS, and JNS stands for Jersey Neur Neuropathy with Splayed Forelimbs. Um, so just like any other undesirable genetic factor, um, in order for that offspring to be affected, it needs to receive a copy from each of the parents um, from that haplotype. As far as what you might see out of the calves, these calves will be born, they're probably unable to stand, they'd have significant um, extension or real straight limbs, real stiffness of the forelimbs. Uh, the calves themselves, they're generally pretty bright at birth, but they're definitely going to have some neurological symptoms, um, some issues with kind of convulsive behavior. Um, there's been some being noted with like dislocated shoulders, some cleft palate types of things or other birth facial soft tissue or bone structure issues. Uh, now, I know that folks would say, well, well, there's limber legs in the Jersey breed. It is different than limber legs. Um, the GNS and limber legs, they're not found on the same chromosome, um, and they do have a few subtle differences in the symptoms. So uh, why this is being introduced as a genetic, um, undesirable genetic factor and not just a haplotype um, is because there is significant economic impact to a lost calf, which would be around $150. Um, when this fully gets introduced, which the data itself, there's plans to have it flow in the system in January. So you're likely to hear about this a little bit more here in about a month. Um, there, there's not going to be um, folks with jerseys being able to offer males for sale or females for sale or embryos without disclosing whether it's a carrier or not. Um, we did take an initial look through the Gen X lineup. And um, actually that lineup, our lineup for Gen X looks very good. Uh, there's really no current bull that is a carrier of it. Uh, it's for the most part in the Chrome and Critic P um, family lines. Um, those are the ones that really do the most uh, damage in the breed. So again, like I said, we're gonna hear a lot more about this come um, January when the data is flowing. Um, it will be on pedigrees that are coming off of Jersey. Um, the frequency in the population is around 6%. So 
So that basically means that 94% of the population are free um, of the JNS. So um, it's no different than any other traditional genetic recessive. Um, when you have the um, two that are carriers, um, you basically have a quarter of a chance of having an affected calf, a 50% chance that that offspring is potentially going to carry it on to the next generation, and a 25% chance that that calf is completely normal and won't carry it. So that's a, a very typical um, definition that we're used to when we're talking about genetic recessives. So, uh, but enough with the, the new things that are introduced here for December, because I know that John has some exciting bull highlights that he'd like to go here moving forward. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks, Jenny. A really good update on feed save, heifer lovability, um, you know, the new recessive that we found in the Jersey. I will add that we did see kind of a little bit of a mini base change uh, this proof round. So if we're selecting on net merit, we did notice about a minus 10 drop uh, in net merit from August to December. So keep that in mind as you're looking at bulls that we did see an industry-wide drop uh, from August to December. But I'm gonna go into a little bit of the bull highlights next. Um, a really exciting proof round. We released 30 new bulls, about 20 new Holstein, uh, 10 new Jersey. Uh, so we're excited to have new bulls for our Gen X customers across the world. Uh, if we look at our pipeline, our major pipeline for Gen X is Peak, our female program. Uh, currently, if we look at all bulls across the world, uh, the Peak female program has bred 25% of the top 100 net merit uh, males in the world. Uh, so this is number one. There's no other prefix out there that has bred more top net merit bulls than Peak at this moment. So really testament to our female program. If we look at female spread, uh, Peak has bred 20% of the top 100 females in the world, uh, which would be also number one by prefix. So excited about our new releases and excited about our pipeline moving forward as we continue to introduce exciting bulls to the Gen X lineup. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Holstein bulls that we release. So I'm gonna go through some of the bulls individually. I think a common theme in our Holstein bulls is high production, really great DPR and really great udders. So when we look across our new releases and how they look, those are the type of traits that they have. So first of all, I'm gonna start with a bull uh, by the name of D Young Next Wave. This is a uh, free agent bull that we bought out in the state of California. His code is 1H15551. Uh, he's an Alta Roberts son, and he's actually our new leader on the ICC index. Uh, what makes him really unique are his health traits. He's exceptional for productive life, daughter pregnancy rate, uh, somatic cell score, really great components. Um, so if you're looking for a bull that's gonna take uh, your cows to the next level in the health department, uh, next way is that kind of bull. Another new release that we have uh, was spread by our peak female program. His name is Break Even. His code is 1H15461. What I really like about him is his unique pedigree and his excellent combination of traits. So he is a Timberlake uh, by a Resolve Sun. So quite, quite unique compared to what we currently have in the Gen X lineup. He's over 1500 pounds of milk. He's over two on DPR and he's nearly two points on utter composite. So he really checks all of the boxes when you look at his transmitting. And then on top of that, he's got a unique pedigree uh, that will make it really easy for our customers to use across the world. Uh, another bull, so Jenny had highlighted in the feed save portion about a bull named uh, Curfew. So Curfew is bred by Winstar uh, out in the state of Idaho. Uh, his code is 1H. 15517. Uh, he's another unique pedigree bull, uh, being a Crosby out of a windfall. Um, another bull, lots of milk, 1,200 pounds of milk, nearly one on DPR, nearly one points on udder, and he's really an outlier when it comes to feed saved. Um, I had taken a look at the top bulls in the world that were above 800 net merit and ranked them by feed saved, so he would be a top five bull in the world for that. He's over 300 on his feed save evaluation. So he's nearly three standard deviations from the average. So we expect that the daughters of curfew 
will be very efficient uh, with the feed that they eat and they'll save our customers a lot of money. Um, we also did introduce a couple of new homozygous poll options. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, two sons by Alta Delson P. Uh, one of these bulls, uh, Dash Pot or Dash Spot PP, uh, if you were to rank him globally, he'd be a top five uh, net merit homozygous pulled bull in the world. So we continue to invest in our pulled bloodlines uh, because we at Genex want to continue to be a leader in pulled genetics. So that's a little bit of the highlights on the Holstein side. comments about individual bulls, we can definitely answer those at the end. Um, next, I'm going to go into the jersey. Uh, this was a very exciting proof round on the jersey side uh, with our new releases. We had 11 new release bulls, but when we look at our top bulls that we release, uh, we released a couple of uh, previous peak mating sires in Razor Sharp and in Light. Uh, these are two bulls that we use very heavily within our female program. And we're excited uh, to have and, and to sell. Um, these two bulls are both herd registry bulls or HR. They don't have any uh, brackets. They don't have any JX. Uh, so for our customers that are looking for herd registry bulls, they do fit that bill. A couple of high production sires, really good on somatic cell. Really excited to uh, introduce these bulls. So that's kind of a little quick recap of what we released on the Holstein and the Jersey side. Uh, we have some questions that have come in uh, while we've been presenting, so we're going to try to attack some of those. Uh, we encourage you to ask more questions as we go uh, because we want to make sure that we get everything answered from uh, everyone across the world. So I will uh, look through the list of questions and uh, we'll delegate these between Jenny and I. So there was a question that came in about feed save and uh, whether we can expect that in the Jersey breed. So I will uh, let Jenny uh, handle that question. So what can you tell us about feed saved in Jersey, Jenny? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a good point, Leah. The, the CDCB new feed save trait did come out just for Holstein only. Um, obviously, there does need to be a research population pulled together for the Jersey breed um, in order to establish the, the feed save trait. Um, I'd say just like any other new trait, uh, it's maybe a little bit more difficult to have the numbers uh, to be able to do research within the Jersey breed as compared to Holstein. Um, but of course, never say never. This trait is something that is going to be very impactful in the next few years. Um, I can't give you an exact timeline on when that will come for the Jersey breed, um, but certainly would say I would expect that to be the next thing that uh, they start to take a look at. Perfect. We have some genetic questions in here I'll try to tackle. Um, so Alana asks, what are your most popular sire of sun on the Jersey side things right now? So I did talk a little bit about Razor Sharp. We are still using Razor Sharp within our female program. We really like him. Um, you know, the fact that he's going to make uh, herd registry potential sires. He's got a lot of combined fat and protein, really good health. Uh, we're using him. We're also using a bull by the name of Sasso. He's a zinc son. So zinc is a Gen X bull. Uh, we really like Sasso because he's got really good udders, really good DPR, and really good CFP. Uh, another bull to talk about that will be in the Gen X lineup, um, maybe come April. His name is Super Crush P. Uh, so we have a high ranking pole bull within our pipeline uh, that we're going to use to make some really high uh, male and female progeny. So those are some of the bulls that we're using right now uh, within our peak female program uh, that we're excited about. Um, Anne asks, what Holstein bulls are you most excited about as? mating sires? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So um, pretty soon here, we're going to have uh, access or have some of our high sons by Zazzle and Plinkle in our pipeline. Uh, so we have a lot of bulls in waiting that rank within the top 100 for net merit. So uh, we have some bulls that we're excited about that are just a few months off from making semen. 
Um, we also have a bull named Galapagos, which is a Gen X bull. He's sired by Millennial, uh, which is currently in our lineup. Uh, this is a bull that's around 10 months of age that we're just starting to make semen on and that we're excited to get using. So oftentimes what we see is we get bulls used within our female program to get the very first progeny. And then once we build up enough inventory, uh, we tend to release those bulls uh, within the Gen X lineup. Um, I'll see if, if Jenny has, uh, wants to take this question from Rebecca, was there a Holstein bull that added progeny this proof round that was a nice surprise? Hmm. Boy, I'm trying to think, um, I can't recall off the top of my head. There was only one or two that added progeny this go around. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to come up with a name right off the top of my head. Um, I do recall though. Oh, I think Rory. Rory was um, one that added progeny. I believe he's a global bull. Yeah. In, in general, uh, Lebecca, I think when I look at the August to December proof run, there weren't too many surprises. Things were pretty stable as terms of our bull offering, you know, even the genetics within our female program, which is a good thing. We want our genetics to be stable. So, um, we do enjoy a proof round that is not full of surprises. So I'd say it was a good proof round for that. Yep. And Abby chimed in. Yep. Rory uh, Konzel. That's a bull that yeah, was bred over by Mass Farms in Wisconsin. You know, he was, uh, had a really solid proof day and we have a lot of Konzel sons within our Gen X pipeline. All right, we have a question from Joel. He had asked, what can we expect when using feed save trait and grazing systems of Latin America? Well, from, so I'm gonna from what I, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, John, Jenny. Here. Okay, um, I, I read quite a few um, different studies and I know there was some work um, in, New Zealand, Australia, uh, where they were looking at feed saved. Um, and so, I mean, the idea is that no matter what, you're you're looking at how much this animal consumes, what you expect it to consume versus what it actually consumes. So regardless of what kind of system that you're in, you're going to be able to save feed. Um, in, and as far as the grazing systems, I mean, there's obviously there's dollars incorporated in maintaining pastures. Um, if the cows are eating less, there's less pasture maintenance. Um, so there's definitely an impact to using the feed save trait, no matter what kind of system that you're working in. And yeah, I know, John, we, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, Joe, I think we it would be fair to assume that there would be a high correlation between the different management systems within North America and within those grazing systems in Latin America. So it may not be a one-to-one -one correlation, but there should be a pretty high correlation uh, between the different management systems uh, between those two geographical areas. All right, those are, those are some of the questions that came in. I'm gonna call last call for questions uh, right now. Um, I would say if there's any questions that people think about, you can, uh, you know, ask them directly on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll make sure to get back to everyone as quick as possible with uh, answers, recommendations, et cetera. Um, but I guess if nothing else is coming in, um, you know, want to thank everyone for their time this morning. I uh, thank all our customers across the world for, you know, uh, believing in our genetics and, in choosing Genix. So I uh, want to thank everyone and uh, wish everyone a great rest of the day. Yep. Thanks everyone.